Okay, so we're aiming to look at some starting points for 20th century family military research to look at the scope of the major repositories, that is the places you need to look at if you're going to, to research World War I ancestor, and to look at some approaches to effective searching. The sorts of things which start us off on a search. I don't know about you, but this little item, this gift box which Princess Mary organised as a gift from the nation, raised money, uh, and they sent it out full of things like tobacco or cake, or in the cases of Indians, they went and got spices, and the nurses got chocolate. We had one sitting around at home, and one of the um, family had scratched his name on it. They used to be fairly frequent, but I wouldn't be surprised if a few of you have got some of them at home as well. It may be a photo of an ancestor, or a letter, or something that you found that stirs your thoughts about who this person could be. It could be something like a medal, which we often hear about. So where do you go from there to find out about them? Now, there is government and non-government material. Firstly, we have gathered together a collection of websites. And you, they are actually linked to particular spots you can go into for effective searching, the things we know you'll want to look at. We've also got CD-ROMs. We've also got an online catalogue and databases. And there are the Australian newspapers online, Trove. And, and they're free, unlike the British one. We've also got books <laughs> with histories, regimental histories, biographies, memoirs, all sorts of things like that. On microform, again, there are newspapers which are are on trove and are not on trove. We also have some of those records on microfilm as well as original documents. Photographs, they can also be accessed independently of newspapers on trove. And of course, you know, the Queensland State Library contributes to that, but you get a wider collection. Um, we've also got cutting books and files, letters, diaries, and other documents. Just to look briefly at our useful websites for family historians, I've done a cut and paste of three sites which you would not find together on the page. The Australian War Memorial, the National Archives and the Commonwealth War Graves. But you would, all, you would find them all at Australia Wide. Our useful websites are divided first of all by country and then with each, within each country, by, uh, within Australia by state. And within each particular organisation, they are organised alphabetically. But note too that you will see that we have links to where we know that you want to go. So with the Australian War Memorial, biographical databases, the collection database, um, and with the National Archives, search the collection. So that most of our sites, by the way, are free. And you do not need a card to access them. There are some sites you need a card for, and we'll be talking about those later. But they are very good starting points, and they, of course, are listed in your notes. The National Archives of Australia is a very important place to begin with because it has the service records. And I think many of you would be aware that they are a little gold mine of information, of all sorts of information uh, that you wouldn't expect to find. They have a couple of um, parts of that website which are particularly relevant to uh, World War I, and that is mapping our Anzacs, which we'll be talking about, record search, photo search, and of course they are linked to the Australian War Memorial. This is the home page of the National Archives. It's, it's, with, with looking at websites, it's, it's usually not a case of the road not taken. If you miss a road, there are usually many other roads to that same place. And the National Archives is an example of that. So if you wanted to find mapping our Anzacs, you can go from the home page to the A to Z of information and records um, management, and you will find there M for mapping our Anzacs. It allows you to hover your mouse over a particular place 
and then to find out those who were enlisted or who were born in that place. Notice that people are putting scrapbook entries there and various tributes. Um, and this is going to go into another project, which they're still developing, and this, it will be actually incorporated into it, one that's being done with the New Zealand government. So we're going to have a look at Mareeba. Now, actually hovering and getting the right spot cannot, it's not always deadly easy, but there you go. If you wanted to know um, about those in Mareeba, this is wonderful for local historians as well as family historians. And we're particularly looking at the North because the North is, according to the North, often forgotten. And when we click, we find there are 33 people and we can see here one of the gains, Hugh Gain. If we click on that, we will get, you know, his place of birth, place of enlistment, next of kin, and we can click on his World War I file. Now, this is the sort of thing most of us will want to start with. Is there anyone who hasn't looked at one of these service files? Sometimes I go to 50 or 60 pages. And here we are looking at Hugh Gaines. Uh, we, we learn about where he was born, his age right down to the months. He's 21 and five months. He was a labourer. Um, it tells us who his next of kin is. Has he been convicted by a civil power? No, he hasn't. And he's in the 9th Battalion, a very famous one for Queenslanders. We also get his height, his complexion, eyes, hair and religion, and any distinctive marks. The distinctive marks can sometimes be very interesting. But then there's the correspondence. Um, and this is um, in relation to Mrs Annie Ford of Belgian Gardens, Townsville, which tells us, with reference to your recent application, for the issue of a nearest female relative badge in respect of your relationship to the undermentioned, and they list the three brothers, the three Gain brothers, I am to request that you complete the enclosed form of statutory declaration and return the same to this office. So she is claiming the nearest female relative. The parents had died of these three boys just before the war. The Australian War Memorial, and you know, you'd end up very easily connecting to that. Includes a people and collections database, official histories, war diaries and unit histories, a glossary and encyclopedia, and these days a blog. What is happening increasingly with these websites is that they're interactive. So they will highlight something and write about it, but you also get a chance to contribute. And it's that weaving of your contribution which enriches what's going on. So we're much more aware of the people who were involved in the war. They also, of course, have a number of centenary projects. The Australian War Memorial site is very well organised and you'll find there are always plenty of options to get where you want to go if you look at the footer, the top and the side bars. So, and I don't know how clear this is, this is the embarkation role of Bertie Gain. There are two nominal roles for World War I. There's the embarkation role and one that's called the nominal role, but they are both roles with names on it. The embarkation role was taken at the time that they were embarking for service overseas. And it has quite a bit of information. Their rank, their age, their trade, uh, their address when they enrolled, the next of kin, uh, and Bertie gives his brother uh, James, and where he is, Oakland, Cairns Railway Line, his religion, the date of joining, and how much they'll be paid. Now, the number that we're given there on the right can often change during the war, but you will get more information on this initial role than you will later. The nominal role, as it's called, is the one that was filled out when they, at the end of the war, and you note there it says RTA, Return to Australia. You might find KIA, Killed in Action. Um, and of course, it doesn't have the same amount of information as was given at the beginning of the war. There's also 
a CD-ROM that's extremely popular up on level three uh, in the microform area, and that's Queenslanders Who Fought in the Great War. It was originally published in 1919, and it's digitised and searchable. There are biographies of two and a half thousand Queensland servicemen. There are over two and a quarter thousand portraits. Now, there's a slight bias because it's supplied by the family. But it does give you information about enlistment, next of kin, medals, uh, and it's also available on Find My Past. And here we see two of the Gain brothers, Hugh Gain, and we find out quite a bit about him in a, in a fairly simple synopsis, and Jack Gain, similarly. Okay, we've mentioned the National Archives and its strong links to the Australian War Memorial. And I might add, there are many more things about the Australian War Memorial which you can find quite easily on the website. I have given a brief overview on the sheet because I know that some people just like to get a brief overview. But you can find that same information and more if you have a look at the website. Now, newspapers are fairly critical if you're going to look at people at a local level. They give the accounts of the enlistments. They report on those who have been <coughs> wounded. There's information from family letters, usually of only the most cheerful sort. Um, and photographs of the soldiers, the leave takings and the battlefields. To get that local news is, is it's a very rich source of information. So here we have a look at the Cairns Post. The Cairns Post is telling us, pictured in this week's Herald is a group of well-known Cairns soldiers. And then photographs of um, Private S. Peterson, Babinda, Jack Gain, returning from um, Romani is a capital war scene snapped on the spot by Trooper Langlands of Cairns. It's always fairly cheerful and snappy. Now, we've only fairly recently got up on Trove, the Northern Herald, where you will get a lot of your pictorial comment, uh, pictorial content, sorry, is in the weekend papers. The um, Courier had the Queenslander, the Telegraph had the Week, we've also got the Truth, and you're now allowed to read it. We weren't. <laughs> but Cairns had the Northern Herald, and one of the things that um, we discovered was how much special material there was in the Northern Herald you would not pick up in the Brisbane papers. And it is really good to see that as the anniversary of the commencement of World War I is coming around, that that has gone up recently. So there we have, you know, um, John Thomas Gain and Hugh Gain, etc. They're telling us that they are um, enlisting. Excuse me. Yes. Sorry. To get that information, do you simply <coughs> search for Crane, Crane or whatever. Gain. Gain. Yeah. And it would have found that newspaper link? Or you have to search the microfilm and then just look? It's gone up on Trove, so it should be keyword searchable at the Northern Herald. Or you can just do the lazy thing and just go into Queensland and put in Hugh Gain. And it will cross-reference. It should, so. yes. I would be looking at Trove. That's, we particularly wanted it up for that reason. Now, the problem with the photographs in the Queenslander, as many of you have probably realised, is that the captions were handwritten. Um, we are, in fact, we've got an index of those which is going up um, towards the end of the year. I think you'll find that there are a few there. But note what you can find in the Northern Herald. They're typed. Now, we all know there are prob problems with optical character recognition, but um, I think you will still be able to find a few of them. I'm not quite sure how I found that photograph of Hugh Gain. I found it a couple of years ago when I was going to Cairns and I wanted some um, material for, to go to Cairns and, and, and I realised that there were many people who didn't understand that there was a weekend version of the Cairns paper and that there was such a rich collection of material. So this, you know, a lot of these are just your local lads. They're not going to win the Victoria Cross, but they will mean a lot to people because they're local. 
And you can see they're quite powerful images as well. And you get a sense of young men on the verge of something quite significant they probably don't understand, but are, you know, taking it with serious intent. And there is the photograph of Bertie Gain from the Queenslander. Note that it's handwritten, and that's the problem with finding it. There's Jack Gain from the Queenslander, similarly. But as we've already said, hopefully the index will be up and the images are going to be re-scanned at a higher resolution. So you'll be able to get a better image. I know that a lot of people have been in to have a look at the microfilm and have found better images. Okay, and here's something from the Tableland Advertiser, which isn't on Trove, and one of the reasons why you could look at our cutting files. Is everyone aware that there are clipping files held in John Oxley for, that are biographical and some that are organised by place? Um, and they can be a little treasure of things you wouldn't expect to find. And this is something I found looking up gain in the biographical files. It's the picture of the three Gain brothers who met up for the first time on service uh, in January 1919 in France. Huey, Bertie and Jack. The sort of thing that the family's going to treasure back home. And the sort of thing that's probably not going to make it into the courier, but will certainly make it into the local um, paper in Cairns. And I also found this in the clippings files. This is Jack Gain uh, when he died. It tells us that he died recently in Brisbane at, at 86. Um, a member of a pioneer far north family, narrowly survived death in World War I and went on to live a long and happy life and gave good service to the community. It tells us where he was born, uh, who his parents were, uh, how his father had a bullock team, that they lived on the Walsh River. Uh, in his later years, he was a cripple and Jack took over the bullock teams. And it also tells us that the parents died not long before the boys enlisted. So we get a pretty good picture of the gains by looking at the National Archives records, material we can find on the Australian War Memorial, a collection of material on Trove, and other material in the clipping files that is organised biographically. Now, as I mentioned, those weekend papers have a lot of pictorial um, content. And so here we can see, lest we forget, um, and the beginnings of the celebration of Anzac Day. And this is a school commemoration, the first Anzac Day the children gathering, and then the arrangements being made in 1916. So in addition to finding information about individuals, you can also get quite a good context of how people at the time are viewing it, even if it is a somewhat censored view of it. The landing at Gallipoli, as it's recorded at the time for the general public, now, the National Archives, and we've already mentioned ways you could search for records there, um, has a photographic collection which can be quite powerful. And this is uh, one where we've got a Turkish soldier in camouflage. They're guarding the Turkish officer. Um, and, of course, you know, you can look, look this up, you know, using terms like Gallipoli, which is what I think I used. Here is one of a group of soldiers... Now, if you recognise any of the soldiers in these, this photograph or any of the other photographs, I think National Archives would like to hear from you. We had a look through mapping our Anzacs, but as I've mentioned, um, you don't ever have to worry about the road not taken because there's always another way on the net. And you can go in through record search. And this is the sort of thing we can do. Now, those of you who've had any contact with us over the last three and a half years will know that we're on the search for the background of John Leake, Queensland's first VC. I'm 
somebody's mobile. Okay. <coughs> and, of course, what we have discovered is that he wasn't totally consistent in the way he recorded his past. So if we go into record search and we put leak and then we choose uh, under this category of records here, World War I, we find here is a record about him. Now, it tells us that he was born in Portsmouth. He enlisted in Rockhampton. Yes, that, all of that's true. And his next of kin George, is George Leake, who's in Saskatchewan, whom no one's ever been able to actually locate. If you click on the document, it will take you to his file. And there it is telling us he's, he was um, born in Portsmouth, Hampshire. It gives us his age, his occupation as a teamster. And he's crossed out his next of kin, George Leake, and replaced it with Ma Miss May Chapman from Wales, whom he would marry at the end of the war. And we've already said you can get all sorts of surprising documents in a, in a um, service record. One of them here is his marriage record to uh, Beatrice May Chapman. And he tells us his father is... James Leake, deceased, and that he was a minor. And uh, this is sort of quite interesting, really. Is he really? Where and when was he born? We're becoming quite interested in this now. He's our first VC. So we start looking at the Australian War Memorial. And you'll find, as we have with these two case studies, you're moving backwards and forwards between them. You don't just usually use one and then go on to the other, but you move between them. The collection database has got all these art, photographs, recordings, heraldry, technology, and war diaries. So what do they have related to John Leake? Here is a photograph, which according to the information supplied by him, and which was on this um, photograph initially at the War Memorial, was that he was surrounded probably by friends and family at Portsmouth. The only thing is, they're the gates of Buckingham Palace. <laughs> and we know that his family's, you know, the parents are dead. And there are reasons why we know who a lot of these people are. And they're not his family. Um, there was also this photograph was reproduced in a, this South Australian Chronicle. So we were able to see that it was Buckingham Palace apart from the gates in the background. But uh, Beatrice May Chapman was from Cardiff and Cardiff was very excited about this young VC who now is claiming Welsh uh, parentage and everything he did was recorded in the local papers. So we know who this young lady is with whom he's holding hands and who this man is. Nobody's questioning that he deserved the VC. It was quite an extraordinary uh, deed. But trying to find out his background, this is in the Cardiff Times. The Western Mail went to town. Every time he was gassed, every time he was wounded, every time he came to Cardiff, it was recorded. And so we know that this is Beatrice May Chapman, the young lady with whom he was holding hands, and that he was, she was the young lady who was on the wedding certificate in 1918. And, of course, it's telling us leaving Buckingham Palace. It wasn't Portsmouth at all. Now, he's also told us when he gets married for the second time in Australia that um, his name is William John Edward Leake and he was born in Canada. <laughs> but what he tells them in Cardiff is that it, um, his parents hailed from Bryn Mawr and Cardiff and <coughs> Private Leake's parents left Wales 30 years ago and eight years later, he was born in Queensland. So we have at least three options to choose from. And we've never been able to find him born in any of those places with that name. So we're still on the hunt. But going back to this collection database for a moment, we found that interesting photograph of, um, of John Leake. But we had this flyer sent to us about the White City, could we explain what the White City was? And we could see down here 
that uh, it was printed in Ann Street, the Valley. Well, that has to be Brisbane, doesn't it? And it's AIF Amusements. We did a big ring around and nobody could tell us what this white city was. Um, so where is it? What is it? We can see that there's a lot of entertainment. There's a restaurant and um, it's quite interesting to see the sort of food that they had and that they were showing films and all sorts of things. And we found out from the diary of Verdi George Schwinghana that it was constructed for the troops amusements. It had a free picture show, boxing hall and restaurants. Concert parties came out from Brisbane. It is funny to think that Anogra was considered so far away that they came out there, but there you go. So we worked out it was at Anogra near Brisbane. But when we looked at the collection database and put in White City in Brisbane, we found a whole series of pictures of it. Pictures and information we could get nowhere else we were able to pick up in the collection database of the Australian War Memorial. So it's a little treasure trove of the unexpected. And you can see the picture theatre there and you'll see pictures of the restaurants and whatever. This is the home page of the Australian War Memorial and you can see that it's quite well set out at the top. You can see what the blog posts are and other information you can find and all the things which are going on there because for the next four years it's going to be very busy. What we're talking about now is obviously going to change a lot. Some of the things which they have which will be of interest to you are their um, sheets on family history. Note that they're listed down there at the side. So you can click on these things by going to the footer, by going to the side. You can find these links in a number of different places. They also have some quite powerful images of young people at a particular stage of their lives. Did some research and then you created something. How do you get it published so that it becomes a publication? Okay, um, you're talking about in relation to the Australian War Memorial. Yes, if you had a particular ancestor who was. Okay, uh, I would make a point of exploring that site. They're very keen to put up blogs. Um, you might also like to listen to what Simon Farley's got to say, because he's going to be telling us about the Q Anzac. 100 project. So there are lots of options. As we've already said, there's a lot of interactive content where they want your contributions and stories in a number of different places. Okay, the, the people database, we've already talked about the embarkation and nominal roles, um, the role of honour, which is for those who died in the war, the commemorative roles, those who did not see active service but died during the war, and we're, we're obviously providing service. Honours and awards, the Red Cross wounded and missing, often the personal detail there may be all that we've got. People profiles and biographies, which is something which they're developing on the website. And of course, links to the Commonwealth War Graves, where the listing are, and the personal information of those who died overseas is recorded. Um, these are some of the information sheets available. Uh, and of course, searching Australian military service, prisoners of war, which we haven't talked about, the war casualties, the unit histories and the maps. We're not going to go into those, but I do want to alert you to the fact that they're there. People profiles and biographies. Um, this is a list of private records digitised so far. And this could be something that you might want to consult. I've obviously only done a small selection. It might be something to which you can contribute. We're going to talk about a particular soldier who Simon is going to follow up <coughs> with. And that is Private George Samuel Devaney. He, his, his father came to Australia on the Flying Cloud in 1870 with his brother. And Hugh Devaney uh, was, actually had a, um, a milling, saw milling business up near Helladon. And George was a, his son was a farmer. So we can see here that he's, he's applied for home leave. And people who were farmers often did this. He wants to say goodbye to his parents and to attend to business. Often they are more specific and say, planting a crop, bringing in a crop, you know, mum can't do it, this sort of thing. 
So they still, they were actually leaving unfinished business behind in order to go to war. And then we see the sort of thing which men, a number of people find quite distressing when they see it on the record, killed in action, or as it's abbreviated, KIA in the field. And then something that many of us would find quite moving are the list of effects which are returned. And we're told here, a diary, letters, photos, a knife, small trinket, YMCA wallet damaged, cards and 13 coins. And th this is what is actually sent home to his mother, a rather pitiful little collection of what's left of him from overseas. This is how he is recorded in the role of honour at the Australian War Memorial, his service number, rank, unit, date of death, place, age, where he obviously was born and grew up, the cemetery he's involved in, and it also tells us where he is honoured at the Australian War Memorial. I would imagine some of you have actually visited those sites at the War Memorial. And then we can see the role of on a circular in, a, in association with where he is actually acknowledged. And all the links to other things like service records and the Commonwealth War Graves. You can always make the links. The Australian War Memorial is excellent at that. And so this is the role of honour circular, which acknowledges someone who died in service. It tells us, gives us his number, his battalion, uh, his birthplace, where killed, um, and that he was a farmer, and even gives us his school, Helladon State. <coughs> Name and address of the parent or other person giving the information, his sister, Mary Devaney. And again, we can see, and I don't know how clear this is, because I can't see it very clearly, although I thought I could once, um, we can see his embarkation listing, um, and his mother is Mrs Hugh Devaney, and she was the one to whom the effects were sent. We know because he died in action that he will be acknowledged at the Commonwealth War Graves site. And all the information about all of these is in the sheet that you've been given. And we can see here, once again, the cemetery, the regiment, and whatever. Again, the personal information son of Hugh and Jane Watson Devaney, born at Hellerton. Is everyone aware that you can generate a certificate that carries that? For a lot of people, that's extremely important. It will have that information, but it just does a little bit more honour to people that you can um, generate that certificate. And all you need to do is hit the download. We've mentioned local newspapers in relation to the Gain family and how they were, when they were going overseas, acknowledged, and Hugh Gain was picked up again at the end of his life. And here are some more Queenslanders somewhere in England. And this is George Devaney. This is just a casual picture that they sent home. And in this case, I think I found it simply by keyword searching. What's sad about this, just a happy, relaxed picture of these young men, July 1917, within a few months, he would be dead. Uh, and that's quite sad when you think that was probably the last picture anyone would see of him. So the local paper is quite a powerful way to find out about the soldiers. Red Cross. Here we've got Private William John Walsh. Various people would tell you um, what happened to them. So we've just got killed in action here, certified by headquarters list. But then we've got a little bit more that's personal here. He was died at Gallipoli, was in charge up from the beach um, with witness on the day of the landing. Missing at the first roll call, about a week later a Turkish prisoner was captured and Walsh's disc was found on him. Uh, the Turks took no prisoners on the day of the landing and they concluded he was dead, a fine big fellow, about 41, he was actually about 37, and his wife does nurse, nursing work in Brisbane. And if you have a look at the service record, she writes asking for the personal effects, 
and she's a bit sad that his wristwatch with his initials isn't found. She'd like to give it to their adopted son. So you find yourself moving between these sites quite a bit. The Australian War Memorial also has a lot of information on military units, the history of World War I, a glossary, encyclopedia, and information sheets, which we've mentioned. So you can always fill out the information from what you find. And the glossary, we've already mentioned KIA, which is killed in action, and RTA, re return to Australia. But it also can mean the Royal Thai Army. There are, so you can never just assume, unless you understand the context, what the abbreviations mean. Sometimes you'll get a half a dozen different meanings for the same abbreviation. Sometimes it's as if they're speaking another language. Um, the encyclopedia has a, a, a wealth of knowledge as well. So if you wanted to find out about the Victoria Cross that John Leake won, you could actually go into the encyclopedia and search that, why it was awarded, um, and other links to honours and awards um, and, and various books. Unit histories. Two of the famous battalions of World War I for Queenslanders, one of them was the 9th. Good table of contents, and this one is by Norman Harvey. You get maps, diagrams and illustrations. So unit histories, and we've got a huge collection of them. You'll find one of our lists, the select list, has a number of those unit histories mentioned. An index, valuable in trying to search any of this material. The Australasian Biographical Archive <coughs> is just one of the many biographical sources you can use. We have this on feet. <coughs> and it gathers together biographical information from a number of different sources. Another obvious one you'll find online and which is listed in your sheet is the Australian Dictionary of Biography. And here we're talking about Charles Bean who wrote the official history of World War I and details of that are on your sheet. British records, we're not going to concentrate a great deal on that, but do use the catalogue and check the following. The National Archives has some wonderful information guides um, and also there are records on Ancestry. And if you use Ancestry in the library, it's free. And also the Commonwealth War Graves is important because it doesn't just cover Australian soldiers but the Commonwealth soldiers. Newspaper records? Well, there's the Times Digital and 19th century British Library newspapers. You can use them at the library, you can use them at home but you need to use your library card if you're accessing it from home. The British Newspaper Archive, which is the British equivalent of Trove, you can access only online at the State Library, simply because that's the condition of access which has been granted. But it's been a mine of information on John Leake. It just doesn't tell us where he was really born. So. There are lots of e-resources and a lot of them are free. Useful websites for family historians, which we've touched on, organised by geographic area and then alphabetically within that area. And it's more than just about Queensland. We've got subscription databases like the 19th century British newspapers and the Times Digital Archive. So you can go beyond the Australian papers, even for Australians. Ancestry, find my past. British newspaper archive and lots of CDs and DVDs. So in a, a summary at this stage, a vast amount of material is available, but what I've touched on is only what is beginning to become available. There'll be a lot more content coming in from people about their families. So the human dimension should be significantly enlarged over the next four years. Original records are being digitised and put online in a way that you can not only read but contribute to. We provide access to a lot of records, useful websites, um, and we've got other materials such as the biographies, photographs, newspapers, which we talked about quite a bit for individuals, histories, letters, memoirs, clipping files and cutting books. Now, Simon will be talking a lot more about how that John Oxley material, that original material, can enlarge an understanding of what it was like for those people going to the war.